What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, you know, I'm going to introduce today's guest, Matt Bressler of TDF Ventures in a second. But, you know, Matt, I like to just point people to other episodes that are cool that people should check out. Um, past episodes, some of my favorites out there, I had Nolan Bushnell on, um, who is the founder of Atari. He was Steve Jobs' mentor, and he talks about how um, he turned down, Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000. And why he said, no, I'm going to hear some of your, I'm going to hear some of Matt's maybe, uh uh-oh, we should have invested in that stories uh, as well. I also had a Moise Navone of Mobileye and he talks about how Mobileye was acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion. And, but what struck me about the story was a sacrifice. You know, this is a journey. This is an up and down journey. He talked about how he had to go back to his wife and kids and tell them, I have to, we have to pull out all out of all extracurricular activities. There's no more eating out because we're, we're hitting a point where it's just not looking amazing right now. And actually I mentioned this because Matt, you're going to talk about Idelic, which is predictive analytics for the trucking industry. And what Mobileye did when they first started to monetize Mobileye, which is kind of fueling the autonomous vehicles, they used it in the trucking industry to have like those blinking lights. So when a car would come up behind someone, a, a light would blink so that it wouldn't, you know, it would prevent accidents for truckers. So we'll talk about that relates to, to one of your companies as well. Um, that and many more, check out inspiredinsider.com. And uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And, you know, for me, Matt, Relationships are the number one thing in my life. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. I've seen no better way to profile my friends, the people I admire, their companies I admire on my podcast and shout them out to the world. So podcasting, I believe there will be a day, like as every business has a website, I believe every business will have or should have a podcast as well. So if you have questions, you're a business and you're thinking of starting a podcast, We've done this for over 10 years. We are an easy button for people. So you can check out rise25.com. I am excited to introduce today's guest and a shout out to Amira Villiani. And you probably know uh, her from college. Like Matt and her know each other from college. She runs glow.fm. They grow membership revenue with podcasts actually. And that's how I met Matt. And Matt Bressler is principal at TDF Ventures. If you haven't heard of TDF Ventures, check it out. It's an early stage venture capital firm with offices in DC and Silicon Valley. And they focus on startups that serve enterprise markets and the infrastructure, software, services. There's so many industries and they're really looking at who are going to be disruptive to maybe boring markets. And uh, they invest uh, from over $150 million in the permanent pool of capital. And they believe the power of technology will improve lives and support development, uh, essentially. And and Matt is no slouch. Okay. So, you know, doing research, Matt, pretty impressive. G Ventures, you're director of investments for Wharton Social Venture Fund, associate for founder.org, graduated uh, at Yale and MBA at Wharton. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be on here. This is when I stop talking and basically you talk the rest of the time. So um, let's start off. How did you get into this world of uh, venture capital? Yeah. So my background originally, I was a, a trained engineer from undergrad and really liked the technology, really liked that work, but quickly learned through a few internships, spending time in the lab that I didn't want to be there my whole life. I didn't like working on the one screw on that one robot leg. I wanted to do things a little bit bigger picture. Um, so when I left college, I went into management consulting, which was- Really quickly, good. growing up, what did you want to be, Matt? An architect. You want to be an architect. Okay. Got it. Mm-hmm. So after I, college, yeah. So mechanical engineering, Yale. Yeah, mechanical engineering. Intense. Mechanical engineering was good for wanting to be an architect, but lacking the artistic ability to pull it off. So I'm able to do the behind the scenes of what's going on there. Yeah. So you were saying next was management consultant. Yeah, which was a great way to actually still take a lot of the way I thought about problems about being an engineer. You know, what are the inputs to an equation? How do we solve that? But apply it to sort of bigger 
business questions rather than the microscopic that the mechanical engineer might be thinking about in the lab. And I love that piece of it. Um, really interesting to work on strategy, to work on growth with pretty interesting companies. And through some of that project work I got to do in consulting, happened to work with a few corporates that were starting to partner with startups, either to help launch a new venture or a new business unit or just spur growth. And that was really the first time I had exposure to entrepreneurs. And I spent my day working with you know, the managers in the corporate function. And I spent my nights then working with the startup CEOs who were trying to go partner with them. And I thought that was a lot more fun. I loved their passion. I loved how every decision they made mattered so much for the impact of their business. And I sort of had this light bulb go off that said, I want to figure out how to go do more with that crowd. No offense to the corporate crowd. So I went back to go get my MBA and try out a few flavors of that. Um, worked with a few startups, worked with a few venture funds at different stages to see what it was like, and fell in love with the venture model of having a portfolio of companies to see applying some of that framework and lens from the management consulting world about what drives business success, what drives success in a market, um, and apply to that early stage with those passionate founders. So I fell in love with it there through a few opportunities and uh, joined my current fund, TDF Ventures, pretty soon after that. I was back in 2015. What made you decide to go to business school as opposed to, you're a smart guy, you probably could have just gone right into working for some of these places. Why go to business school? It was a bit of a luxury and a way to go try 10 different things at once. Um, I don't know how I would have been able to do the same thing or honestly have the same excuse to try working at a startup, working at a different venture fund, working with renewable energy things, which is something else I was trying out at the time, um, and really dip a toe in a lot of different pools, see what clicks with me, with my skill set, with my interests. Um, so it's tough because it pauses your career a little bit. It's a, it's a certainly a big personal investment, um, but I'm happy for it because it sort of also advances thinking capabilities and chance to go figure out what you want to do a little bit faster. Probably an amazing network also. Um, what was a big lesson that you remember taking out of your Warden MBA experience? Yeah. Um, I think I went to school thinking, all right, I'm going to get finance classes. I'm going to get accounting classes. And I remember showing up the first day and learning that there was an entire leadership office and leadership curriculum. And I had never realized, and I think I was pretty skeptical getting there on day one, that that's something you could teach and study and examine. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't take long to convince me that you could do all those things. Um, and I really liked some of the classes that talked about and we really dissected and analyzed what are different leadership approaches and how are there not just one ways to lead and at what point do you do one versus the other? And just because your personality is X doesn't mean you can't adopt, you know, leadership style Y at some point, leadership style Z at a different point. Um, it sort of clicked for me. So, so actually a lot of what I enjoyed from the curriculum of school was less sort of the, the brass tacks and, and the nuts and bolts of business and some of that softer stuff that is harder to quantify sometimes. Yeah. What you went into looking forward to expecting is something spit out completely different in the end. What would you say, what would you say your leadership style is? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I, I think I'm someone who looks for consensus and tries to drive consensus. Um, I certainly have an opinion, but I like to bring people there rather than tell them how it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Walks them through my logic, a uh, very reasoning base. It's the engineer in me that can't help but sort of have the 10 step approach to how I get to a final answer and like to make sure people are on board with me around getting to that. Um, so, so that's what it is. I, I, I like to have sort of other people uh, chime in and, and call out where I'm wrong on those. Um, and I'd rather have my opinion changed by understanding where along the way we disagree. Um, but if I can pre bring people along and have them understand my thinking and get everyone aligned to the same topic that way. I always like that. Yeah, I wanna talk about the team at TDF Ventures for a second. You know, we're yep. talking about leadership and, and we will, I will ask too, I'm, I'm really curious, I'll be walk through some scenarios of kind of maybe early stage, some non-typical approaches you've taken at TDF Ventures, but talk about the team a little bit. What, what, it, what is made up of, you know, TDF Ventures? Yeah, it's a neat team here and a great team to work with every day. It's probably, the reason I joined the firm more than anything. Um, 
we pride ourselves, particularly at the partnership level here, at having X operators on the venture team. Um, we're not the only fund to have it, but not everyone does. And our team here, they were CEO of startup companies. They were executive leaders at growth companies, um, or even some you know big C-suite positions at corporates that are working with these startups, acquiring those startups, et cetera. Um, and having that background not only gives you empathy to go work with the founders that we're working with, but gives you perspective of what does it take to succeed? What does it take to find the right person at this stage of a company? What does it take to actually go build a big partnership to own a sales quota? So having that is super helpful. Um, and then me and, and some others on the team sort of pair with that of not having necessarily had that direct startup executive experience, but coming from management consulting side. Um, so there's a few of us here that have that perspective, which is a little bit more macro, a little bit more data driven, um, and a little bit more structured and sort of thinking through the approach. And I think it's actually our team combining those different viewpoints where when we're together discussing a deal and I can turn to one of my partners who has seen a thousand CEOs and just knows what it takes to find a leader. And I can sort of weigh that against, all right, well, here's how I'm dissecting the plan and really where I see the numbers. Having those two pieces together just makes a great combo. So I think it's those two sides of the coin that, that make our team really, yeah. uh, really function well. And then frankly, it's just good people. And when you're a small team and you're, you're working so closely uh, with each other and with the founders, you want to be around good people. So that's a super important thing. Matt, who's someone from the team in like a valuable piece of advice they've given you? Um, you know, I was looking at the website and you, you do have like just a lot of really experienced people in the field, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, geez. Pegging it to I don't know if there's a. Per, I don't know if there's a particular deal. Maybe talking about one of the deals and how you, you know, maybe someone had a perspective that you weighed into making a decision. Yeah. Yeah. Sort. Well, I I remember. Um, I was maybe alluded to a little bit before. Uh, but the perspective of I think particularly when I was just starting my career here, um, finishing a meeting with a company we were looking at um, and hearing it and running the numbers on my laptop as we're going, looking at a model with some of the data they were showing us and just thinking, boy, the numbers all work. This, this clicks perfectly. Um, th this is a, a sure home run. Uh, and walking out of the meeting, my partner turned to me and saying, those two co-founders will never get along. They'll never survive. And I sort of looked up for a second and realized, you know, I, I'd been heads down in my laptop the whole time thinking about numbers, thinking about the model, not reflecting on the team dynamics. And it was a pretty quick learning of, boy, you know, th this, this person's been in, that shoe, in those shoes, having to sort of work and manage different styles before, knows what it takes. Um, and it goes back to sort of talking about an MBA. Like, there are things that are sometimes harder to teach what works, what doesn't. It's a lot of experience and understanding or really understanding the psychology of people um, for sort of what matters there. So I think realizing how important, how critical that aspect of our businesses and early stage companies, the, the people factor um, was, a, was a quick realization I, I got to have. I, I want to hear about what you look for in a company to invest in a second. But, but piggybacking on that, Matt, was it something you think if you were just, just tuned into it, you would have noticed? Or was it something that this person, because they've seen so many interactions, just something subtle that they saw in that interaction that made them say that? Do you remember? Gosh, I, I, probably the latter. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Right. If I'm I just haven't. curious, if you were tuned yeah. into it, would you have picked up on the same thing? Or just because you were so focused on the numbers? No, you think that person... Because I, yeah. I, can, I can definitely tell you, the more experience you have here, uh, the better it is. It's why I'm lucky to work with a team that yeah. has that. And I wouldn't go found a firm with, <laughs> without sort of being able to go work with uh, people who had that experience. Um, yeah. So I think we're really lucky here to, to have folks that have those pieces. I want to, before I ask about looking at a company, how do you look at a company that you're investing? What do you look for? Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this person's name right, but Li Tung. Yeah. Is that, what is it? Li Tung <laughs> looks, Lei. Lei looks intense. He's intense. On the, on, the, on the team page, I would not want to run into him in a back alley. I, I don't know. He looks super intense. Is that his personality? You don't want to run into him on the back alley, that's for sure. But 
Not for any bad reason. Okay. You know, Lay's such a good member of our team. He's our technical advisor. And I'd say that picture might give you the impression uh, he doesn't sort of, it, it gives you the last impression that he's company's favorite person to go talk to when they talk to him during the diligence process. And it's the opposite. Uh, <laughs> everybody loves him. What's great about him is super technical. He's had a great background. He was a principal architect at Marketo at big uh, engineering jobs at Oracle and, and Siebel. Um, and he's the person that understands everything um, and doesn't try to show up anyone when they're doing that. And we live in a world of big egos. And so to not have that super critical. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's an important member working with yeah. us to help us understand product differentiation, technical superiority as we're digging in with companies. I love his picture. It looks like he could stare a hole in me, like laser focused. Totally. Um, so what do you look for in a company to invest in? Like, just tell me, yeah. Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is, is the, the most overused answer by investors. And <laughs> when I did interviews like this for the first year or two of my career, I tried not to say it, I wanted to be different. And it's only over time I learned how important it is. And it is team. Um, mm. uh, 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 the greatest product opportunity company in the world, I don't think will succeed without a great team. Um, therefore, it is absolutely a prerequisite to have a great company, to have an amazing team behind it. Now, what an amazing team is, we, we can talk about more because I don't think there's a cookie cutter definition of it, um, but we do care about what those pieces are. We care a lot about sort of, is there a reason this team is understanding it? Do they understand this problem better than everyone else? Do they know how to sort of scale it, how, how it'll work today, how it'll work tomorrow, and how it'll work in a few years um, and have some experience building things like that in the past. Um, so we do care a lot about what that team looks like. Right after that then is, what's the value of the product they have relative to the problem out there? Um, understanding from the customer perspective, what are they solving and why is this 10X better than the next best option out there? Things that are incrementally better or provide a little bit of savings, those are hard to get behind because it's hard to see how they're going to go revolutionize an industry. The ones that are having a 10x change um, and a customer can't live without and is the last thing a customer is going to take out of their system um, when things go bad, that's what we really care about. And we look for early signs of that. Um, we're early stage investors. We do seed rounds. We do series A rounds. So we typically like a little bit of traction, handful of customers that are paying. Um, but we'll go really dive in and say, well, what's the ROI when those customers buy the product? Why do they buy it? Once they buy it, do they use more of it? Do they love it? Do you have an understanding of it? Um, is it hard for, do they have nowhere else to turn for a product like this? Um, that's what we really care about. So we look for those early signs of it um, to see if it's there. And then, you know, we'll go test that, check with the market, see if the numbers sort of back it up. But those are the things we really care about. Mark, about what's an example of some early signs that, that you've seen? I think every company would be like, huh, like, I don't know, maybe they don't even see the early signs because you've seen this across so many, you've evaluated so many companies um, that you probably see them maybe even before the business themselves see them. What, what are some example of an early sign that you saw like, yes, this is, this is something that a customer cannot live without and will possibly revolutionize an industry? Yeah, um, we'll, we'll go find customers and talk to them about it. Uh, I've got an e-commerce company called Whitebox uh, they invested in probably two years ago. Um, they do both the back-end solution for e-commerce brands of how to actually fulfill our shipments, get them to the customer, uh, make sure they're packed correctly, do it in a cheap and efficient way, whether the customer's buying on Amazon or on Shopify, um, as well as sort of the front end for that e-commerce brand of how do we put our listings online, on Amazon, on Walmart, on our own Shopify site, promote it properly, price it properly, um, helping brands sort of basically, you make the product, we'll do everything else to help you out. So that's one where I just started calling brands, um, brands I knew, brands that friends knew and said, have you seen something like this? Would you use it? Why, why, what do you use in place of this now? Would it be more valuable to do that? So it's a lot of that first party market research, um, talking to them, gathering those perspectives understanding what, were, what are their questions? How do I then go test that back with the market? Would you pay for this? Why, et cetera? Um, those are the things I really like to do and find information super valuable. 
I could see that if you turn that off overnight, people would be frantic. Like if, if the, basically someone's operating all of their listings and doing all the back end fulfillment, it, it's not something you could just shut off. It's great. And the alternative yeah. is you go find a dozen providers, go help you with it. You're either a massive company and you hire 20 people to do it, or you work with a dozen providers where the technology and data doesn't really talk to one another, or you get white box. I'd recommend so, the latter. Yeah, totally. Uh, so team and then the value to the problem, yep. right? What's, the, what's another? Yeah. So beyond that, we're, we start to look at the metrics around growth. And again, it's usually pretty early, but we start to see how are they scaling? Is there, is there an efficient way to go reach market here? You know, what are they selling the product for? How much effort is it? Can you get that repeatable motion where you're paying back what you're spending to go invest to, to try to sell it pretty quickly? Can you do it at high margins? They're not a high service cost or, or, or cogs associated with it. Um, those are the things. And just, you just have efficient growth. It, as your company starts to you know, grow 10, 20, 30% month over month, can you keep it up uh, as, the, as things scale? Because things always break as things get faster, bigger, you need more people your processes scale, et cetera. So we start to look at the metrics around that. And there's a lot of established metrics that, that investors are looking at around CAC, around LTV, around sales payback, general efficiency growth, those types of things. And we do find those very important as we start to drill down into it. And I know that you said you, you invest in different stages. Is there a uh, kind of a baseline revenue that you wanna see or above before someone approaches you? I don't have a hard one. Um, for me, it's all about, do you, have a, do you have early product market fit? Which to me means, do you have a handful of customers that are buying the same thing from you? You're selling the same thing. You're starting to see some repeatability. Um, I hesitate to define a revenue number because you might be selling to small businesses. It's a low dollar amount, but you're doing it really quick. They're making decisions in a few weeks to a month. And you might be at a few hundred K in revenue and say, yeah, I've got product market fit. I've got 50 customers who are all doing the same thing. And they seem to be coming to me fast. On the other hand, you might have a sophisticated upmarket enterprise technology solution. It takes six to 12 months to sell into those customers. You've got three different customers. They're all want something slightly different. You might be charging them a ton. You might be at 2 million revenue and still might not have product market fit at that point. So it looks different for each company. And so you know it when you see it. Industry-wise, Matt, um, I said a little bit about non-sexy, but very innovative and disruptive. Yep. What are, can you give me some examples from the companies? Totally. Um, we're spending a lot of time these days around logistics and supply chain. Um, it's a huge spend category uh, in the US. And most of the companies there have been very slow to adopt technology, you know, versus the healthcare world, the financial world. Those were early adopters to tech. It's why FinTech and health tech have been, you know, established areas investors have been in for a while and big companies have been built. Um, a lot of supply chain logistics has been slower to that. At the same time, it completely lends itself to digitize data, what you can do with it once it's structured, once you're running interesting analyses on it. Um, and companies need a lot of help there. So there's a great chance for software and technology solutions to come in there. Um, one company I'm involved with from our portfolio in that world is a company called Idelic. Um, they do predictive analytics and driver management for trucking fleets, um, both heavy duty and, and lighter fleets. Um, their goal is to make the roads safer at a big picture, but for the individual fleet, lower their accident costs, lower their insurance premiums, and lower driver turnover. So back to ROI, huge for them. These are things they really care about, which without a solution like Idelic, they're trying to manage through spreadsheets, they're trying to do their best, but it's hard for them to actually understand all the data points coming from different systems that have emerged over the past decade, from within the cab, from outside the cab, from the HR system, from the truck management system, integrate that all together and go apply modern machine learning methods to it, to actually find signal in the noise of all that data there. That's what Idelic does. It's a great example of um, they're selling to, to trucking fleets, trucking carriers that want the insights, might not be able to go run all the analyses themselves. So a software solution that's delivering it like Idelic is, is hugely valuable for them. How did you discover Idelic? So I spend a bunch of time when it's possible to go travel. 
um, in, you know, quote unquote, second tier markets in the US around the venture and, and startup world. Um, Idelic's based out of Pittsburgh. I spend time in Indianapolis. Uh, colleagues of mine go to Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, Chicago. And these are markets where it's easier now than it ever has been to go start a company. There's great talent. People who have, as workforce have gone remote. There might be people who have had experience at big tech companies or you've sort of been through a cycle in a lot of these cities for some of interesting companies to grow and, and develop talent and sort of understand what it takes to grow a technology business. Um, so you're seeing more support there. And there's some early capital there from seed investors, angel investors, but a little bit less at our stage. So we've found it's been really effective to go find partners to go work with in those markets, some of the early investors, work with them on you know, some of their portfolio. When they get to a stage, you might be ready for us to go partner on it. Um, so I had met Idelic through that, um, through some of my work in Pittsburgh, uh, around the, the Carnegie Mellon ecosystem and some of the seed innovation ecosystem there a few years ago. So would you, I don't know if this is the right word, but it, not underserved, but it's not getting the attention like the Silicon Valley companies. Totally. Exactly it. And I think it is actually underserved from the capital market. Yeah, I love it. That's amazing. Adelic. Now there's a non-typical case, right? Which is Travis Security. Mm -hmm. All right. Talk about how that happened and about that. Sure. So um, the other thing I should mention about TDF is... At any given time, we've got maybe half a dozen investment themes that we're being proactive on, um, not just waiting for companies to come in the door that are doing the next great thing. We, we certainly do that, and, and the doors are always open, but we're thinking ourselves and trying to put together our research and understanding from what we're hearing from our own companies, our own experiences, our network about what's interesting, what's next. So we've always done a lot of work around cybersecurity. Um, being based out of Washington, D.C., we see a lot of good stuff coming out of the uh, national security groups and affiliated agencies in that world. And I've had good success investing there. But we sort of saw this dilemma a few years ago when we looked at the rate of spending on cybersecurity tools, which was going up, 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 up. And we looked at uh, the rate of breaches, which sadly were tracking that and going up, 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 up. And we said, well, this can't continue forever. We can't spend our way out of this problem. So when we sort of thought about parallels about what other industries had done when they couldn't totally uh, circle the risk, there's been interesting insurance markets that have popped up, transfer that risk, be able to cap it, understand it in, in that sense. And cybersecurity insurance has been an early emerging area. Um, so we started looking into it and realized, yep, it's early days, there's a few billion in premium that gets written every year in this area. So and growing at you know, 20, 30% year over year. So really interesting, high growth market, already pretty big, but growing even bigger. But as we dug into it, we realized the products there were failing. Um, boards were requiring companies to get them, but CISOs and even some of the C-suite weren't so happy with what they offered. They thought they were getting ripped off, they thought it wasn't causing enough protection, and they thought it was overpriced. At the same time, you had some of the insurance companies that were happy with the returns they were getting there. They were growing. Uh, people were buying their product. They felt like it was fine. Um, so as area, we said, all right, you've got a growing market. You've got customers dissatisfied with the product. We could probably dig in and figure out how, you know, what's the issue and, and how do we find someone that's going to fix it? We spent a lot of time looking and, and talked to a lot of really interesting, great companies that are doing things. And um, a lot of them have, have seen good success. Um, but we just didn't find the right match. You know, it has to be the right timing with the right team, with the right model and the right location. So it's a high bar. Um, so we did that work for a bit, couldn't find the right opportunity and, and sort of put that work on the shelf for, for a bit. Um, we decided, though, uh, about a year ago to partner with a really neat venture studio called High Alpha out in Indianapolis. And uh, if people don't know the venture studio model, um, it's essentially uh, like the venture capital world, but rather than look for ideas from the outside, they try to produce ideas internally um, and go find a team to go back and help them from the early days build company around it with some shared services that would make it a lot faster to go build when you're working with them across a few different companies. Um, so I started working with the, the group there, put together a business model down on paper uh, and said, if we can go recruit really good team behind this, I think we're going to have something. 
Um, fortunately, we did. Uh, we got an ex CISO uh, who'd been an exact target in Salesforce, a great product builder and CTO who'd been at Carbonite and, and a few other stops along the way uh, to go start building the team uh, and launch it last year. And within a, a few short months, built a product, had partners signed up, had paying customers, um, and they're off to the races right now. So it's a lot of fun. We're, we're not typically getting That's involved. That's a big undertaking. It is. It is. Fortunately, we've got a great team and partner behind it to work with it, work with us on it. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And it's somewhere where when we had such high conviction around the market and around the opportunity and even around the model, uh, we wanted to, to spend the time and effort on it. Uh, and so far, so good. And it sounds like the first step in that, I mean, besides the idea and like all the research is to find a person to lead the team. And what, what would that conversation look like when you approach this person or start talking to this person? Yeah. So fortunately, the CEO there, he was one of the people we called out during the ideation to sort of validate it, uh, to say, are we crazy here or something here makes sense. So got to meet a lot of people over the course of that. And he was someone from day one said, yep, totally get this. And let me tell you how I think about it. Mm. And it was sort of a perfect mind meld at that point of, all right, here's how we're thinking about the world. Here's how you, Jim, are thinking about the world. How do we start to mash this together? Mm -hmm. uh, and then finding sort of understanding how his skill set pair with his co-founder um, sort of really round out the package on what it takes to build a company early on um, made a lot of sense. Plus, he's someone where there was really just one degree of separation between me and him and understanding when you can sort of understand all right what's it really like to work with this person what, what does he do and backs against the wall what drives him what motivates him um that's really helpful to understand so that that was key here when yeah. it's such a really higher as well yeah and when you're bringing your ideas it's people kind of raise their hand because they're on board with the mission and they totally see what the vision and they see the execution part that's right yeah that's right i love it I want to talk about Run Deck for a second, and because this is part of you know another part of the journey, which is acquisition in the end. Um, but before we talk about Run uh, Run Deck, my favorite, like so, if you anyone goes to tdfventures.com, they go to the investment page. They can see you can see all the the different investments. You can see all the different uh, companies exited. I don't know why, Matt, but my favorite logo is Lion Guard. Um, what does LionGuard do? Yeah, LionGuard, they're, they're a service for MSP providers. And if you know the MSP world, MSPs are sort of the outsourced IT organizations that work with a lot of the small, medium businesses uh, across the world. Um, it. It's a huge market. There's 20,000 or so or more uh, MSPs out there. Um, and there's big ones, there's small ones. They've got some of their own technology because you imagine it's a, it's a unique situation to be in to go manage the tools and, uh, and assets and resources of a third party organization. There's a lot of things you have to do differently than if you were managing it yourself. Um, LionGuard fits in there. It's a tool for those MSPs to use to actually understand a lot more of the information about what's actually happening in their customers, what assets are there, how do we go automatically go take inventory of a lot of those and get other information about what's in use, et cetera. So it's a tool that makes the jobs of those MSPs a lot easier, gives them clarity, gives them better understanding of what their customers are doing, allows them to run their businesses better. Well, so IT providers would use LionGuard as a solution to run their B2B business, essentially. Exactly. Got mm -hmm. it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I love the, I love the logo. Um, yeah. But a, let's talk podcast, about- man, I, I thought you were going to tell me you, you liked Pushkin. Pushkin. I didn't, I didn't you know, there's so many on here. Tell me about Pushkin. They're, they're a great podcast studio. Um, okay. Uh, some really good uh, names behind them. Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, oh, nice. One that serves good household name. Um, they've been putting out great consumer content. It's, it's not typical for us, um, but one we really like and a good team behind. And we're big fans of, of both how they run the business and the work they put out. Love it. Uh, let's talk about run deck. So there's a section of exited, you know, people check out uh, that section, um, the, a laundry list of, of companies. What happened with uh, run deck? Tell, tell me from a little bit the beginning to then what happened with the, the exit. Yeah. Run deck was a really, uh, really great story. Great team. Um, pair of co-founders there that going back to what do we really care about in team? 
were experts in what they did. Um, run next company in the IT ops world. So they go help IT ops departments run more efficiently. Um, the people in this world, they're plagued by tickets and requests from around the organization. I need to spin up this server. Uh, this group needs access to X, Y, Z. Um, and it's a lot of the same things that get requested that just take time to go work between organizations, go do the manual builds, um, go put policies in place, uh, and it can drive them crazy. So uh, this is the world that Alex and Damon, the co-founders there came from. They started doing some consulting work with big organizations that had these issues to help them go run more efficiently. Um, and they created an, an open source uh, tool and community to go make this better. That, that was originally what Rundeck was. Started catching on, uh, had tons of users from within organizations starting to build their own automation scripts and what they call run books built off of um, their open source and said, nice, this is catching on. Um, maybe we should do more than just consulting here, but maybe we should start to build product company around it uh, and start to build enterprise features around both what we're offering for free, help customers go implement it and, and give them some more than they can do. So they did that. And fortunately, it was a company where you know, they, they were consulting, they had revenue coming in, they didn't need to take investment right away. So they'd gotten pretty far down the path from product market fit perspective and even a revenue traction perspective to say, we've got something here. And only sort of when they had that did they say, all right, we could probably start to run a little bit faster. Plus, we could probably use some support from a team that's experienced this before. Um, how, how do we sort of make sure we don't fall into any same pitfalls other people have? How do we make sure that we make the most of the opportunity we have? Um, at the same time, they didn't want to sort of go for broke. They wanted to be in control of the company. They wanted to still own a big piece of building day. And we've got a model where we're happy to be flexible. And we care a lot about making sure founders are happy and we're working on a solution that works for them. So we partnered with them. We were the only investor um, and spent a few years working with them, really maturing the business. Um, growing it from small scale to a pretty sizable scale. Uh, and they had a really good opportunity come up this year um, that a great public technology company, PagerDuty, um, became interested in what they were doing uh, and it fit in really well with their strategy. Um, they serve some of the same uh, customers, some of the same people at those customers as Rundeck did and offered a feature and product that was super collaborative to them. And I think any time in an acquisition when you're being bought, not just because you're adding revenue and you're adding dollars to the bottom line, but you're making the existing product and offering of mm -hmm. the purchasing company better, mm -hmm. that's when it's a great fit. Because they could roll it out to all of their customers right totally. away. It, yeah. it's, just, it's the case where one plus one is more than two uh, and it creates value there. Um, and not only that, but it allows our team there, the Rundeck team, to go keep working on and add to what they're doing and have the resources they want to go continue to add to the Rundeck product in a great supportive organization and just make it better there and have broader reach. So really great outcome for the team, for the product, for the customers, and you know, for our, for our balance sheet as well. I love it. Matt, I have two last questions. Before I ask them, I want to point people to tdfventures.com. Check out the website. Um, check out Rise25, check out more episodes of InspiredInsider.com. Are there any other places besides tdfventures.com that we should point people towards online? That's the best spot. That's all the best spot? Okay. Our link there too. So if cool. people want to learn more about them, uh, you can see our whole investments page. Cool. Check it out. Last two questions, Matt. Um, I said in the beginning of the interview about Nolan Bushnell. So I want to hear maybe a big miss and then on the flip side, a big win. Like a company that's like, this just hit out of the park for us. Do you remember any big misses? We can't win them all, right? One that you passed on that maybe you're like, oh, looking back. Yeah, I'll tell you what's really hard. Um, and there's even two instances I can think about. Both local companies in DC in the cybersecurity world. And I saw both of them when... It was essentially a founder coming in, free product market fit. Um, an awesome idea on paper, 
maybe some early conversations with customer, but really no revenue to speak of. But clearly, an amazing founder, either super subject matter expert, uh, really dynamic, great experience having done something similar with a great track record in the past, um, but looking to sort of raise at a stage that just felt pretty early to what we do here at TDF. Um, both of those now was sort of our companies that have continued to raise money at higher and higher valuations uh, and just sort of always felt a little out of reach as a result. But that's been the hardest ones to look back on where you've said, boy, I was impressed at the time. Yeah. I knew this could be a big yeah. deal. Um, but some of those things I usually look for just weren't yeah. there yet. It's a bit more of a gamble at that point. It is. Yeah. It is. And it's a different skill set and a different risk level to invest at that point. So it's hard to, to beat myself or our team up too much yeah. for not taking it there. At the same time, it's pretty easy to go measure the results of missed results in, yeah. <laughs> on paper in retrospect. Yeah, I'm mean, listen, hindsight's always 2020, but it, I always like to know because, you know, even whatever, you take Hall of Fame baseball players, they're successful like 30% of the time with their hits, right? And so the right. same goes for That's right. um, seeing things. Um, you'll see more things than most people, but everyone's going to, it's just, a, it's a trade-off or a gamble at some point, right? Yeah, you're right. So big win. Yeah. I'll mention one that's uh, near and dear to the whole team at TDF. Um, a local company called Edge Connects. And Edge Connects, uh, actually the CEO has been a venture partner at TDF for a long time, Randy Brockman. Um, what Edge Connects does is build edge data centers. And they really got their start as some of the internet content media companies were figuring out, how do we actually put content closer to where population centers are? Can't have the big data centers, all the content, in the middle of nowhere, because even though this moves pretty fast electronically, there are still lag times, delay times, transport costs associated with it. So Edge Connects figured out how do we actually go run a network of distributed and smaller data centers on the edge where we can put this content, we can host it there um, and make it work for those companies. Now a bunch of the hyperscale players use it, a bunch of the big cloud ones use it to run their edge data center. So really neat company. Um, what was neat about it is it was seated here by the TDF team. It predates my time. Um, we had our team that was uh, uh, around the table from day one. A former uh, colleague from TDF in my role is now the CFO there. So in addition to sort of having you know, the CEO as venture partner, uh, another loyal member on the C-suite there. And they've grown and grown and grown over the years and they were just bought for a few billion dollars um by eqt uh, a big private fund out of europe um that's been really interested in the infrastructure space so really impressive to see a company go from seed and idea stage in our own conference room down the hall with some of our colleagues uh to um a multi-billion dollar exit uh with data centers all across the world where it is today matt this has been amazing. Thank you for sharing this. Congratulations yeah, really with everything that you do at TDF Ventures. Everyone check out tdfventures.com and check out other episodes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.